Hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whoever and wherever you are. Thank you for joining me on this session where we will be looking at a winning guide to emails. Uh, I'm Andrew Nicholson, founder and CEO of Coolier MA, marketing automation for agencies and many more clients. Um, and I'm going to be your guide for today. So thank you for joining me. Okay. Um, this is going to be the first in the sessions we're going to have three parts this session is going to be covering best practice you know what does good email marketing look like um the second part in this uh, um, in this series is tentatively called uh, what does crap b2b email marketing look like and the third part is going to be covering integration in um and combining your stack to make a more efficient more effective sales solution okay um so i'll be cracking on with best practice right now so First thing, question you're going to be asking yourself, or lots of people ask themselves, is why email marketing? Because um, let's be honest, email marketing is a bit old school, right? And it is. It, is, it absolutely is. But the reason it's still with us today, what, nearly 40 years since the first email was sent, is because it works, because it's effective. You know, we've gone through COVID. We've gone through pandemics. Channels have changed. We've now got Zoom. Zoom is fantastic. It's an incredibly popular tool. But it's still not as popular as email. Um, and in a world where face to face meetings have, have waned considerably um, due to necessity, email has become even more important. Um, and you can see here one of the main reasons why email is so fundamentally important is because it generates the highest ROI of any digital marketing communication channel. It absolutely blows TV, radio, social, video, display, paid, and affiliate out of the water. Uh, in fact, it's 40 times. Um, higher, sorry, email beats these guys and has 40 times the ROI in terms of customer acquisition um, than things like Twitter and Facebook. Um, now, you will notice on there that um, LinkedIn isn't on that on that chart. It's not for any deliberate reasons, just because that particular chart doesn't happen to have LinkedIn in there. Um, and, I, you know, I love LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great tool. I don't consider LinkedIn as a, you know, fundamentally an outreach tool. I see LinkedIn very much as a, a brand and reach um, tool. So, you know, build your content strategy on LinkedIn, promote, talk, engage, um, converse. But really, for your cold outreach, for your sales outreach, email is where it's at. Um, and when we're talking about email, we can really break it down. Let me shift this a little bit uh, into two components. Yeah, well, I've gone too far. Go back, let me move this. Out of the way, you don't want to see my face anyway. Ugly face. Um, okay, you can really break email down into two components, B2B or B2C. Now, we are going to be talking about B2B today because that really is, you know, we're a marketing automation platform. Marketing automation really does do B2B well. Um, and that's for all of these reasons here. Now, B2B has a longer sales cycle. Uh, B2B needs nurturing. There's multiple decision makers. There's multiple buyers quite often involved in the process. Um, it's a considered purchase. So email marketing and email nurturing and lead scoring, all those tools that wrap around that um, really do come before in B2B, which is where and why we specialize in that area. Um, so what's the difference between B2B and B2C emails? Because they're all just emails, right? Surely. Um, well, the first big difference is Email in B2B isn't a sales tool. Well, that's, that sounds kind of counterintuitive because I'm talking about winning emails and how to generate sales through uh, email marketing. Um, but it's not. Email is about building relationships in the world of B2B. So there's a big green tick next to relationships. Nobody, nobody has ever received an email from a stranger in a B2B context and gone, you know what? I'm going to spend £50,000 with this customer or with this supplier. It's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. Email is there about delivering value. About, it's about building relationships. Uh, it's about staying front of mind. It's about adding value. Time and time again, I say, and I will say this again throughout this presentation, it's about adding value to the recipient. Um, whereas B2C, it's more about spontaneous, compulsive buys. Like, here's, here's an offer. Go and buy that. Buy this T-shirt. Buy, buy, buy this thing. Buy, buy this xbox whatever um it's more spontaneous people do receive emails in the b2c context and go straight online and buy the things that the emails are promoting of course they do um 
B2B, that rarely, if ever, happens. But that's okay because it's longer sales cycle. So the reality is you don't ever expect an instant sale with B2B. There's always a little bit of work that needs to go into it to build that relationship. Um, talking about relationships, B2B emails you will find primarily are plain text. Why is that? Well, because an email that's plain text is coming from a person going to a person. It's about building relationships, as we said there. Um, whereas B2C, you'll find it's more image heavy, more HTML based. Um, it's normally branded coming from a, from a company, a brand, rather than an individual within that company. Um, for that reason, um, you will find that it's a lot glossier. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples in a second, um, well, one of each. Um, and then in terms of life cycle, we talked about that. So an email for in the B2B world, it's normally one of a series. It's normally one of a cadence, as we call it. Um, these cadences are about responding, listening to your audience. It's about drip, drip, dripping that message, building that relationship, delivering value um, so that you become a trusted partner, that you become the, the expert in your area. Um, in terms of B2C, normally quite a short sales cycle, almost instantaneous at times. So you can understand why more of an impulsive buy um, let's click on and let's have a look at what a typical B to C, sorry, B to B email looks like. So here we go. I've got two screens up here, which is why it's confusing. Um, so this is a B to B email, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. So it is plain text. It's very clean. It's very uncluttered. Um, it's coming from a person. It's coming from Joel and the B team at Buffer, but primarily it's coming from Joel. You see Joel's picture at the bottom. Um, it's using plain text, so it's coming from a person. It's delivering value. Each one of these points here, um, seven things Star Wars taught me about productivity. Read or add to buffer. This is how colors of your brand affect conversions and engagement. Read or add to buffer. Um, but really, with deflate all of these, there is really one call to action, which is go to buffer and add more posts. And that's that big call to action at the bottom. It's very clean. It's very direct. I know what they want me to do. I know what Joel wants me to do with this email. Um, and because it's coming from Joel, I'm responding to Joel as a person. I'm seeing Joel as a person. Compare that to this one. So this is definitely not coming from a person. This is a B2C example. So it's coming from a brand. It's coming from Sony. It's coming from PS4. Um, it's using lots of imagery. And I'm going to come on to imagery in a second because it's not always a positive thing. Uh, it's more of a formal language. Whereas if we we'll go back again. We can see this, hey there, it's coming, um, it's coming from Joel, he's cool, he's casual, he's probably working in the valley and he's chilling on a beanbag somewhere. None of that here. This is very much, let's get to the point. Um, here's a promo code, use it. Um, it's a lot more cluttered, it's a lot busier. There are multiple calls to action. There's like five LinkedIn uh, icons down at the bottom as well as the Redeem Now voucher. So uh, there's, there's lots going on here. Um, but that's okay. That's okay because it's 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 a B to Z email, as we said. Um, there is, however, a risk associated with having multiple calls to action, um, multiple links, uh, if they're all going off to different places. And I will come on to that, those later. But before I do come on to those, I want to talk about imagery, because whilst everyone says they love, you know, receive an email like this is beautiful. It's been designed by the graphics department. They've spent weeks building it. It's been you know, passed around and shouted about and everybody's tweeted and everyone's happy with it. It's glorious. It's gorgeous. Everything's right. Um, it's going to be less effective than something simple like this. Now, the reason for that is, let's put a shot in here, images and HTML, whilst everyone says they love it, and the marketing department loves to design them um, and the sales department loves to go, yeah, it was beautiful and send them out. Uh, and customers love to receive them. They, they, if you talk to customers, they will tell you they prefer pretty emails. They'll tell you they prefer image-heavy emails. But the reality is they actually respond less to them. Uh, a plain text email is, on average, going to get a 30% higher open rate. It's going to get a 25% higher click-through rate. Um, and you can see here is a, is a nice, this is um, sourced from HubSpot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they do good data. They do, they do good research. Um, this is just showing you how the more images you put in your email, the lower the click rate is going to be because um, it just confuses things. Um, you will also find, I mentioned there, that the open rate goes down and the canny amongst you might be saying, well, hang on, that doesn't make sense because up until the point you open the email, you don't know whether it's plain text or HTML. 
Um, and that is a very good point and well spotted. Um, however, the email clients of this world, the ESPs, email service providers, the Gmails and their like, will know whether the email is plain text or HTML. And if you have a HTML heavy email with lots of images and buttons and call to actions, then they're going to push that into the promotions folder. And therefore, it's going to get less visibility. Therefore, less people are going to open it. Um, equally, you're going to see a lower engagement rate, lower click-through rates on HTML emails. Um, and those go around. Those, those come, come around in full circle. So if you're seeing less click-through rates, then more of those emails are going to end up in the spam bucket. If more emails end up in the spam bucket, then less people are going to open them. So it's a bit of a revolving door around um, HTML versus plain text. Plain text is more effective. Take it from me. Take it from HubSpot. Look at the stats yourself. Okay. Now, moving on from that, let's take a look at what goes into a good B2B email campaign. We've already said that plain text, um, but there's more to it than that. I've condensed this down into 10 core factors. I've tried to make this as brief as possible. It's a little bit meaty, a little bit chunky, but I'll try and whiz through it as quickly as possible um, so that you can get the takeaways. So the first most important thing about your email campaigns is that they should be opted in. You know, or and or legitimate interest. Now, okay, everyone will tell you that the best kind of data is the opt-in data. Um, and of course it is, of course it is. If somebody actively comes to your site and they, they fill out a form, a call to action, and say, yes, I want to receive your emails, that's amazing. Um, that's really good, they're engaged. Um, if someone has you know, said, okay, I want to receive your lead magnet, your top 10 tips to great email writing, let's use that, why not? Uh, your top 10 tips to, to great email writing. Um, and they've submitted a, a Facebook um, lead gen advert or click, clicked on that or a LinkedIn lead gen advert or a Google lead gen advert, whatever, they, whatever medium you're using um, to push out that lead magnet. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. They're really engaged. They're hot to trot. Um, or they've come to your website and they've signed up to your newsletter. Brilliant. Um, or whatever, whatever these things are, they, they, they are engaged. Um, that is what best practice looks like. Of course it is. Um, but the reality is the internet is a big old place. There are lots and lots of prospects out there. There's lots of customers and all your competitors are doing exactly the same thing as you are. They, they're pushing out great content. They're working hard to create lead magnets. Um, they're all understanding their customers' pains and trying to help them resolve them because you know they're good marketers and that's what marketers do. So there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of noise. And getting your message heard and getting that inbound message heard is hard. It's really, really hard. And unless you are someone like HubSpot, where you have a warehouse packed to the rafters with content writers and bloggers and you're stuffing them in and you're electrocuting them with a cattle plug going, write more content, um, it's very expensive and it's very time consuming for you as a business to be able to produce that content and get it out there and get it out there is the most important thing. So rather than waiting for customers to come to you, um, you can actively prospect and go to your customers. And that's where legitimate interest comes in. So legitimate interest to me is just as viable um, a source of data or a, a channel for generating, um, pushing your data out as if people are opting in. So what gen uh, GDPR told us was legit with legitimate interest, if you have a legitimate interest in contacting and reaching out to a business contact, that's your legitimate interest, not theirs, um, to promote your service or product, you may do so. Um, and that is where prospecting comes in. And prospecting is what, you know, the third way. Um, it's a great way of building up your data and your lists. Um, so GDPR allows for prospecting and a legitimate interest. Uh, if you can show a legitimate interest to in reaching out to someone, that's okay. As long as they can unsubscribe and say, no, thank you, I'm not interested. Um, so how do you go about reaching out? How do you go about prospecting? Well, there are data providers out there or da data tools out there, um, such as Hunter.io, Prospect.io, Get Prospect. And uh, these are tools that tap into the world's greatest repository of business data. It's known as LinkedIn. LinkedIn's awesome. Um, and they sit on top of that as a layer. So you can use um, LinkedIn to filter 
to say, okay, well, I'm looking for people in the automotive trade who are decision makers, who work in companies with over 500 employees in Devon, for example, very targeted precision uh, segment there. Um, and then you can put these tools on top, like I say, Prospect.io, to extract the data on those individuals and push them into your email marketing or your marketing automation tools. I'm not advocating going out and buying bulk data here. Bulk data by its very nature, it's almost always out of date. Um, we find it as you know, as a, as a customer or as an email service provider, very hard work. If customers, our clients go out and buy bulk data, invariably their campaigns get throttled because the bounce rates are too high. And we've got to say, look, no guys, it's not working. This is bad data. Go back um, to the drawing board. If you're going to insist on using this, but you have to then run it through cleansing tools like Never Bounce. Um, it's packed full of um, accept all um, email addresses, which you know aren't really valid email addresses. You know, you don't know that there's somebody at the end of that inbox waiting to receive those emails. Um, so LinkedIn is a far, far better source of data because it's the only data source where people actively go and update their own information. When you get a promotion, when you move to a different company, First thing you do is go into LinkedIn and tell LinkedIn and tell the world that you've done it. Therefore, LinkedIn is a far more up-to-date data source. Uh, and then if you're using prospecting tools on top of that, fantastic. Um, okay, so what else would we consider best practice? Well, you said opt-in is best practice. Prospecting for live data is best practice. Get out and buying bulk data. No, that's not best practice. Um, Segmenting and targeting your database. You know, if, if you already know what your ideal customer looks like, your ideal customer profile, then brilliant. You already have a dream segment. Um, but you can segment by so much more. The more relevant your email content, the better the results will be. Spraying out emails and praying that some of that shit sticks, that's not a viable marketing strategy. That is, I mean, that didn't work back in the 1990s. It certainly doesn't work now. You need to understand how your messaging relates and adapts to your different prospects, your different clients. So you could target by geodemographic um, approaches such as age, gender, location, spend, favorite color, or sorry, uh, economic um, sector, favorite color type of, type of pet, I'm crying out loud. Um, all of those things you can segment by. You can also segment based on behavioral information. So engagement, for example, um, shopping basket activity, whether they clicked on emails, when they've, whether they signed up to your webinars, whether they've downloaded your PDFs, your brochures, your thought leadership pieces. Those are great ways of segmenting your database and your customers and your prospects. Um, or you could just segment by type, nice, simple one. Are they prospects? Are they clients? Are they old, prospect, lost clients? Um, those are great ways of segmenting as well. Just be aware that with the latest iOS 15 updates, which depending on when you're watching this, has is either about to happen or it has already happened. Um, you're no longer going to be able to um, target your email campaigns based on opening IP because Apple are blocking that information and stopping you from seeing it anymore. And you're not, or also not going to be able to start targeting on open rates. And people have opened your email campaigns because Apple is also going to be, um, well, not hiding that information. Apple is actually going to be opening every single email. So 70% of the world's emails. Um, are going to be opened by Apple, which whether right or wrong, it's going to be firing all these open events and it's going to make it, you know, targeting and segmenting by open is completely irrelevant. So that's going to come to an end as well very soon. Um, okay. Second most important um, component of best practice to me is making sure that every email you send adding value to the recipient. Ask yourself, always ask yourself, what is in it for them? Number one rule of email marketing to my mind is to deliver value to the recipient of your communications. So am I making their life better? Am I making them smile? Am I making them look good in front of their boss? These are all things that you need to be considering before you press send on your email. What is in it for them? The reason you're watching this session today most likely um, it's because you've received an email from the team at Coolia. And the team of Coolia are offering you value by saying, okay, well, you know what? Andrew, he knows a few things about email marketing. Um, let's share that. Let's offer that information that's in here. Let's give it to you. 
freely without any obligation. Let's give you something of use to you because again, that is how relationships are built. So I am very much drinking my own champagne here by sitting here giving you this presentation. Um, Value-added content, support, don't sell. That's how you build relationships. Lovely. Okay, keep it short. Don't make me read bloody war and peace. Get to the point. Move on from that. Get to the point. Um, keep it very focused. Don't try and get me to do 100 different things. Click this, click that, move there, sign up to this. Duh, 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 duh. Keep it very to the point. Ideally, you should have one call to action from every email. Now, what is that call to action? I want you to attend a webinar. I want you to download this piece. I want you to pick up the phone and bloody well call me. Um, keep it clean. Keep it like OCD clean. Clear out all your clutter. As an aside to this, Gmail will penalize you and Gmail and the other email service providers as well. If you have more than three links in your email, um, that seems to be the magic number. One, two or three, you can get away with it. Three and upwards, um, you risk ending up in the promotions tab where you will not get seen. Um, so strip out all that superfluous bump. And what do I mean by superfluous bump? Well, if you're sending out personal emails, you've probably got social icons, social links in your email signature. Guess what? They're all links. They're all outbound links. Get rid of them. Nobody ever bloody clicks on them anyway, apart from spam bots. Um, don't worry. You're not going to miss out because you've not included social icons in your emails. Um, don't include your email address in your emails. You don't need to. If someone wants to reply to your email, they'll just click reply to your email. They won't click the link in your email if it's got your email on it to open up a new window to then reply. It doesn't happen. So remove your email address from your emails. Um, you don't need to put your bloody web address, www.acme.com or whatever it is, in an email. If I want to know what your web address is, I'll just look at your email address. That's all I need to do. Um, so you, know, you have to... Uh, Give people a little bit of uh, credit for being able to work out what your web address is. Um, it's you know, Remove all these superfluous um, links. It will really cut down on the clutter, and it will start getting your emails read because they won't be appearing in the promotions tab. Um, persistence. Persistence pays. So this is, I'd say, probably the third most important thing um, in, in these be this best practice. I've got some great stats for you, and I apologize. I'm going to read these because I'm not so great at memorizing stats, so I'm going to look down here. 44% um, of salespeople give up, uh, up after only one follow-up. That's dreadful. Additionally, 92% of salespeople give up after four no's, but 80% of prospects say no four times before they say yes. So 92% of salespeople miss out on 80% of their opportunities because they're not persistent. In high growth organizations, sales teams make an average of 16 touches per prospect within a two to four week span. Yeah. So that's a lot of touch points. That doesn't have to be picking up the phone and calling, pick up the phone and calling, pick up the phone and calling. Very much you know, using your email marketing automation platform, um, using LinkedIn, using all these different channels and touch points. Um, ideally, you should be able to automate as many of those touch points as possible. Um, but in order to keep your brand front of mind, your agency front of mind, you have to keep touching them. That sounds wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, here we go. In one study by woodpecker.co, Campaigns with four to seven emails per sequence received three times more responses than campaigns with one to three emails in the sequence. So there you go. More is better. And lastly, according to a report by Velocity, the optimal number of email messages is five. And I think that's where this one's come from. Um, so you can see on the screen here, first email, 30% response rate. Second email, 20% response rate. So you sent two emails, 50% of people haven't responded at that point. It takes three, four, five emails to get everyone um, responding. Um, so let's move this over here. So you just see that. There you go. Got the reply here. So that's why persistence pays, folks. Next one, consistent. So when I say consistent, keep your brand consistent. Keep your messaging and your design consistent. You know, when you're sending out your emails, send it consistently from the same person, the same name in the email address so people can build up familiarity. Um, keep your personalization consistent. You know, don't just personalize your emails. If you're 
clicking through from a personalized email, you should be clicking through to a personalized landing page or web page. Um, you don't just forget people because they've gone to your website. In fact, you should make extra effort to remember people because they've clicked on the link and gone through to your website. So your marketing automation tools will enable you to personalize across your platforms, across your different channels. Um, and if nothing else, that's just good manners. Um, talking of personalization, that's the next most important thing with your email communications. It might even be the first most important thing. I think it's you know, personalization and value adding, I think possibly will, you know, they, they receive equal credit there. Um, and I'm not talking about just dear forename in the email subject line. Um, time of day personalization, day of the week personalization, topics and pages of interest that the recipient is displayed of interest in, you know, company name personalization, smart personalization, personalization. Um, these are all absolutely critical to your email communications, understanding who your audience is and writing your content, your email content, to respond to their specific pains and challenges to help them specifically rather than generically trying to address every problem to everybody who receives the email. That's what personalization is about, and personalization works. Um, test everything. I know I said uh, your subject lines are buggered because uh, IRS is opening every email, but don't worry about that because there's so much more to testings than subject lines. And subject lines was always a pretty crap kind of testing mechanism because let's be honest, it didn't really help you to understand why people were buying things. It just meant, okay, they opened my emails, more people have opened it, therefore more people have bought my stuff. Great. But how do you actually make people buy more stuff? What was it about your email that got them to buy more stuff? Um, this is where you can delve a little bit deeper now. So let's push subject line testing to one side because it's not going to be working now. It's completely irrelevant. Um, what can you be a subject, oh, sorry, A-B testing against? So it could be things like clicks, really obvious one, A-B testing your click content. You know, what are your calls to action? What, what is your messaging? How is that affecting clicks? Delve a little bit deeper. Page views, webinar signups, purchases, replies. These are the things you should be A-B testing against, not really subject line testing because it was a bit crap. I know it's you know we've been using it as bread and butter. Hey, I've got forty percent open rate. Everybody, I'm brilliant. I'm a great digital marketer. Yes, you are, but actually, there's so much more to it than that. Um, and finally, everything you do should be legal. Uh, GDPR uh, states people should be able to access their data. In fact, not only that they able to access the data, there is their data. The core fundamental shift in GDPR was that you don't own my data. Okay, if you've got Andrew at Coolia.ma in your database, whether it's your CRM or your email marketing tool, um, you're just borrowing it from me. I'm letting you use it. So if I want it back, if I want to update it, if I want to delete it, I can do. It's mine. It's my data, not yours. You're just holding it for me. I am the data subject. You are the data um, owner. Or sorry, I'm the data owner, and you're holding my data for me. Um, so. If you are holding your data on a CRM or an email marketing tool, you need to give a data subject access to that data. Uh, ideally, it should be as easy as possible. You should be able to access it online for a subject access request and pull their own data and update and change the data and delete it if they need to. Um, it's a damn sight easier if they can self-serve that. With Coolia, you can absolutely self-serve your subject access requests rather than having to formally send in an email and you go off and find the data and send it back to them not the best way it's time consuming it's frankly a pain in the ass so you really need a self-serve mechanism for the data subjects um you need to consider where your data sits is it in the eu it should be um does it ever go outside the eu are you integrating it with other tools you know are you sending it out through mailchimp which is in the us or are you sending it out through mailgun on their eu server we are subtle plug there um are you using legitimate interest? Do you have legitimate interest clearly documented? Are you using consent? Do you have consent clearly documented? Is there an audit history of the data, how it's been used, where it was originally sourced? Um, is there an unsubscribe mechanism for the data? There bloody better be, because otherwise you are highly illegal. Um, so all of these things need, on me, <laughs> need to be considered and factored in to your best practice. This goes beyond best practice. This is legal best practice. You need to do this stuff. Okay. That's hopefully a quick overview of what best practice looks like. Um, now I'm going to have a very quick run through, um, just five points about when you should be sending 
your emails. Okay. So the first one here is you know, outreach. So let's call a horse a horse here. Let's call a spade a spade here. I'm talking about cold outreach. It's not a dirty word. Business is done by introducing yourself and the value you or your company delivers to people you don't know. If we were afraid to talk to strangers, we wouldn't sell a bloody thing. So get over that. It's okay in business environment to reach out and do cold outreach. And I've mentioned that there are great tools out there to enable this. Things like Prospect IO, Get Prospect, Hunter. They will help you source lead data. They will help you pass that lead data into your email marketing or COM solution um, through third party tools like Zapier. And we'll be talking about Zapier integration in our third session. Um, and with these tools, you can pretty much find and connect with anyone you want. Now, now just because you can find the data of someone and because you can connect with them, pull out their information, should you? Well, I'm giving three provisos here. First proviso we've already talked about, legitimate interest. I'm just going to move it over here because my proviso is on the right. Legitimate interest. You have to have a legitimate interest. If you are a B2B digital marketing agency, you shouldn't be pulling data on the pizza delivery guy. There's no legitimate interest for you to be doing so. You are breaking the law. If, however, you are approaching um, and sourcing data for, let's say, founders of tech startups, that you know would be of interest and find your services useful, then absolutely you have a legitimate interest in doing so. Just make sure that you have it documented. Uh, personalized, I'm gonna try and click down. What's going on? I've lost my mouse. There we go, got it back. <laughs> okay, make sure when you're personalizing, or you're doing outreach, you're personalizing. That means researching, understanding, not just sending out the same communication to everyone. That's bad outreach um and we've talked about value delivery and i'm going to talk more about value value delivery deliver i can't speak i'm going to talk more about value delivery every email every outreach email you send should be offering value to the recipient i'm going to hammer that home it's so important i'm stating it twice second reason that you can be sending out emails b2b is value delivery and it doesn't just need to be part of your outreach strategy but it should absolutely be fundamental to your outreach strategy it's not necessarily about just winning new customers. It's also about building stronger relationship with your existing customers and contacts and demonstrating thought leadership in your area of expertise. So do you have thought leadership to share? Do you have how-to guides? Are you inviting them to a webinar? Do you have an event that you're running where you would like them to attend? Or indeed, would you like them to speak at? Email is the most effective way of communicating that value. Support, not sales. Going to talk a little bit more later about actually email and how email is both the message and the medium. That's important. Okay. Brand stories. This is where you start to build a personality behind your brand. And I had a lovely example come through. Uh, I was what, last Friday, actually, from Brafton. Now, Brafton are a content agency, and I love this. The brand story they're telling isn't their own, it's IKEA's. There we go. Um, and they tell it brilliantly. They tell it authentically and they tell it with humor. So if I were a potential client, I would get very excited about receiving this email. I mean, come on, what's not to love? It's got a dog in a bag. That's brilliant. Um, and at the end of the email, there's an enticing call to action, which says, you know, want to learn more about our marketing campaigns we, that we put together for our clients, respond back to see examples. So they're trying to get a response. They're trying to generate a response, uh, not a click, it's actually a reply. And email clients, the ESPs, they love to see replies. They love to see conversations taking place. Um, but this is a story. It's in plain text. It's got a few images dropped in, I'll grant you. But it's told humorously. It's told of personality. It's authentically IKEA. I love this email. And I wanted to respond to this email, except we offer a comp competitor service, so I didn't. Um, go on. Now, Whilst I'm not a big fan of using emails to hard sell, and you probably picked up on this, especially in the B2B space, I do have one exception to that rule. And that's when there is a genuine limited offer. Um, you know, when there's something where availability is limited, where it's discounted for a particular time period, this might be seasonal, it might be you've got a surplus of stock, whatever the reason, if it's a genuine value offer, then yes, you should be communicating this to your prospects. Of course you should, because you're delivering value. You know, if, some, if that value is 30% off our, our rack rate, that's value. That's something that needs to be spoken about, and you shouldn't be hiding that. Um, 
And finally, we've got re-engagement emails. So this is where you have your kind of simple six-month check-ins to see how things have progressed. Maybe they were interested, but they, you know, they, they went cold on you. Maybe, maybe other priorities came about. Um, remember, only 3% of your audience, your, your total adjustable market, your TAM, are actively looking for your product or service at any one moment in time. 3%. So that's 97% aren't interested right now. So the chances of your communication hitting home first time you send it are very, very low. We've talked about that already. The availability heuristic, um, Google it, availability heuristic. Um, that tells us that the easier something is to recall, the greater the value you apportion it, okay? So that's pretty much how advertising works. When your prospect is weighing up, you know, whether to call you or your competitor, um, and they will do it at some point in the future, it's the company that comes first to mind that will win every time. So keep bubbling your brand up to the top of their inbox. Keep checking in, even if it's just a quick hello to share some best practice, to share some research, um, to give them your latest uh, PDF or white paper. Keep dropping in, keep saying hi, keep sharing value to stay front of mind. And this can be every couple of months. You know, It doesn't need to be intensive, um, but just make sure that your brand becomes familiar. Um, I just want to shift myself a little. So we can see here, we've got typical tofu, mofu, bofu. Um, anyone who's in marketing understands the concept of funnel, top of funnel, bottom, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. And this is where I was talking earlier about how really email is both the message and the medium. This is going to become my final point for this session. What do I mean by this? Well, an email can be the message itself. And we've seen examples when the email is the message. Absolutely. Those, those examples I showed you earlier were, you know, the email is the message. But email is also the distribution channel for other mediums. So you have a new blog post, you tell people about it by email. You have a new DPF, PDF brochure. How do you get it to people? You get it to them by email. You send it to them. You're hosting a webinar. How do you advertise that webinar? Well, you do it through email, whether you're doing it through you know, go to meetings or go to webinars, native email, or you're doing it yourself. You communicate through email. Email is so ubiquitous, our day to day lives these days, that we don't appreciate just how important it is. You know, since COVID, Zoom and email have become the de facto communication tools for business. It's no longer face to face, and it's not going to change back anytime in the near future. Um, understand how your email works with your content strategy, your total content strategy from top of funnel to bottom. Understand, um, you know, where your blog posts, your information, your problem solving sits at the top, how you can get people into journeys through those, how you can push it out through prospecting. Um, top of funnel, prospecting is perfect for top of funnel because they might not necessarily have a specific pain or they understand their pain at that point, but you can still support them. You know what business they're in. You know what job title they have. So you have a good understanding of the kinds of pains and the kinds of challenges they're going to be experiencing. So you can share support, top of funnel content with that. As you move down the funnel, um, you know people are signing up. They're, they're giving you their details. They'll be more proactive in coming to you. Use email to deliver that support. Use email to send those case studies to build that relationship. And then when it comes down to the bottom of the funnel, yes, it should be a phone call. Yes, it should be a Zoom call. But equally, you can keep going out there. You can get people onto free trials. You can check, so you know, okay, well, you've signed up to a free trial, but you've not done X or Y. You know, you can automate your email processes at that point in order to make sure that they're getting the most value out of that initial touch point about those initial trials, um, about those communications. Um, that shouldn't be automated, by the way, all the time. You know, it's, it's all about personal contact at this level. Um, okay. The next session we're going to be having is going to be on how not to, to write crap emails. Um, so please do check in for that one. Um, we'll be sending details as soon as it's written. Um, I will send you an email to let you know. Uh, well, I'll get one of the team to send you an email anyway. Lovely talking to you. Thank you very much for listening in. Uh, I appreciate this has been quite an intensive session and I've talked very fast to try and get as much information across as possible. But if you do want to, want, to, want to talk, if you do need some support, remember, support, not sales, reach out to us at support at coolia.ma. Let me just, there we go, give you the details there. Support at Coolia MA. We're here to help um, with anything you need in terms of your email or digital marketing outreach strategy. Thank you for listening in and bye.